Captain Cook was the first brewer in New Zealand. He was in Dusky Sound after being at sea for a long, long time, without, out of the sight of land. He was very careful of his crew's health because scurvy was a major problem with crews in those days. So as soon as he arrived in Dusky Sound, he brewed a beer from leaves and, and bark of trees, mainly the rimu tree. Once they'd boiled it all up and taken the branches out, they brewed a beer from it. He had yeast aboard. Um, they tried to recreate it again in the 20th century to see what it would be like, and the general impression was that it was absolutely awful. Joel Pollack, um, an English-born, quite well-off and well-educated uh, young man who spent most of his life roaming around the world, arrived in Kororoka, I think in 1831. He was about 24 or 25 years old, and he set up the first commercial brewery in New Zealand. He must have brought, um, in fact, I'm sure he did bring hops and malt in from Tasmania. Joel Pollack was a very interesting individual, uh, very enterprising. Uh, he came from a Jewish family in London. His father was actually a, a miniature portrait painter. He's got some of his paintings are in fact in the Victorian Albert uh, Museum. He had a number of uh, New Zealand distinctions. He was the first, we believe he was the first Jewish settler here. And uh, um, among other things, he was the first brewer. Uh, and, he, and he was also involved in, in the first uh, jewel in this country. His claim was that um, the alcohol they were drinking in Kororoka, which was a pretty wild town, was uh, awful and dangerous. So he wanted to make beer that was palatable and good for people. Uh, he also happened to make a fortune out of it at the same time. The reason why it was uh, such an important town in the history of uh, the European settlement of New Zealand was its attraction for shipping, and particularly whaling ships that came here. A number of the American whaling ships that came from the New England states, that's on the east coast of the United States, were what were called temperance ships. They didn't carry alcohol. And as you can imagine, um, whalers, whaling ships were at sea for months, if not years in some cases. So, uh, and it was pretty, pretty tiring and dirty work. So one can imagine that the, the whalers and the sailors were pretty keen to get on shore and have a drink or two and a few of the other uh, activities and recreational uh, pastimes that sailors traditionally enjoy. And Kauriaraka offered those in abundance and as a result of that it was known as the hell hole of the Pacific. There were grog shops and there was prostitution and there was revelry all over the place. So a lot of drinking went on in the 1830s and 1840s in, in Russell. His property was destroyed in 1845 when the town was attacked by Honeheke uh, and, uh, and bombarded offshore by the Hazard, the British ship. So it really had quite a, a dramatic history, that town. After the sacking of Kororoka in 1845, Joel Polak, along with lots of other uh, residents of the town, uh, decamped to Auckland. Um, he was also, because he lost a lot of property, he sought unsuccessfully for restitution or compensation for his losses, but I don't think he really received what he felt was his due, and he, so he's pretty uh, disgruntled and despondent about that. He settled in Auckland for a time, and then at some point later, uh, he left the country altogether and went to California, where he died. <laughs> 
contingent in uh, Nelson and also a number of Germans, another great beer drinking country. And so they set up a brewery there uh, in 1841 and it's always been a very strong brewing town. It's interesting uh, what effect Nelson has had on the brewing industry in New Zealand right from the very early days of you know, the second commercial brewery in New Zealand. But over the years, it's just had this powerful influence. Brown and Logan Campbell, William Brown and Logan Campbell set up a brewery in Auckland about probably in 1842, towards the end of 1842. So they were one of the first commercial ventures in Auckland. They established a brewery uh, in Queen Street called the Albert Brewery. Uh, that was closed when they formed the company Campbell and Aaron Freed in 1897. Now a very powerful influence in the Auckland scene and Logan Campbell of course came uh, to be remembered as the father of Auckland because he was here for such a long time. But in his early days, um, he had several financial crises and it was brewing that kept him solvent. And yet, he was always slightly ashamed of the fact that he was involved in the, in the liquor industry at all. The Ward brothers in, in Christchurch, um, they set up a brewery down there. There were four brothers, two of them actually drowned, and one of them um, set up the brewery. Another brother came out from England and um, helped him to establish a, a major industry in Christchurch. Uh, the brother that came out from England finished up as a cabinet minister. It's an interesting aspect of this early New Zealand brewing is that while there was a very strong prohibitionist movement in New Zealand, a lot of the brewers, because they made some money and were very philanthropic, became significant figures in their communities. A lot of mayors were brewers in New Zealand. Some cabinet ministers and um, MPs were brewers, mainly because of their philanthropy and their power in their community. In almost any city in New Zealand in the early days, the biggest building in town was the brewery. Uh, two of the most influential breweries in Auckland in the 19th century were the Captain Cook and the Great Northern Brewery, and they were within literally a couple of kilometres of each other, or a couple of miles in those days, in the Newmarket area along Kyber Pass Road. Thomas Hancock, who failed to make his fortune on the Australian goldfield, started the Captain Cook, uh, and that was at the bottom end of Kyber Pass Road um, near Broadway in Newmarket. So really, Captain Cook started in the pub, the Captain Cook Hotel in 1859. Uh, so he started brewing in the sheds out the back of the pub, uh, supplied the pub with beer, and then established a brewery in 1860.
called Richard Seckham's set up breweries in I think in Plymouth, Wanganui, and I think he went to, to Hamilton. He was a kind of um, you know, peregrinating brewer. But he was a very powerful influence on brewing in New Zealand because he brought good brewing techniques to some of these provincial cities that would probably not otherwise have had that advantage. Founded in 1860, but the first brew didn't go through till around 1861. I think it was Queen's birthday from the accounts that we've seen. Became Great Northern in 1890 and uh, was modernised in 1915 to become Lion Brewery. The notable thing about Richard Seacombe is he had a family crest which had a lion on it uh, and his first brew was called Lion Beer. The family coat of arms was the inspiration for the, the, the name Lion Brewery. Um, his family was, was not particularly happy about his chosen profession. Uh, and um, the, the legend goes that uh, he was determined to make the lions more famous in New Zealand than they were back home. The reason these two breweries were both set up in this Newmarket region was back then Newmarket was a trading area and the great supply of fresh water um, which just kept flowing um, no matter what the conditions and was always pristine. Well it was established there because of the very good water supply flowing through the lava flows underneath, essential for when you're making good beer. Uh, it was an area just outside the main city of Auckland so there was a lot of traffic through, a lot of cattle yards, um, the military establishments and, and toll booths and those sort of things were all around the area as well. So there was a number of hotels sprang up to service the, the troops and other people that were in the area and the, the breweries were there as well to service the hotels. To this day there is still a legend related to that brewery about the well on which it was founded. Richard Seacombe dug 60 feet down into the ground to find a freshwater well which provided the water for the brewery. So the, the brewery closed down in 1960 and then it was demolished in around 1971. The Ehrenfried brothers uh, had been born in Hamburg and uh, in the early 1850s they, followed then a few years later by their three sisters, uh, went to Australia, basically chasing gold. They then came on over to New Zealand. So in 1867, at the first sound of um, gold having been discovered in Thames, they, the two boys, hot-footed it up and they located a site uh, which today is the uh, Thames Bowling Green and uh, its great advantage was that it had a supply of really good spring water and that of course they were able to use for the beer and slowly but surely they established themselves as their profits built up. They bought a series of hotels around Thames. However, not that long after they had arrived, Bernard died. He appears to have been uh, loading some uh, horned cattle onto a barge and he was gored in the head by one of the, uh, the bulls. So Louis Ehrenfried, the older of the brothers, really picks up the business and carries on. At its height, Thames had a population of about 18,000. Uh, that was in the late 60s. 
uh, Auckland, uh, which is an hour and a bit away by uh, boat, only had about 22,000 people at that time. So you can see that Thames is a fairly substantial place, but uh, it goes into decline quite quickly because the availability of surplus gold gave out. Ehrenfried um, wants, of course, to sell his beer, and he finally decides that what he'll do is uh, he'll stand for local government, uh, he'll, he'll up the profile of Ehrenfried, the Ehrenfried name, with a view to uh, um, encouraging people to live uh, in the area, and uh, he acts as mayor for a while in the mid-1870s and then is elected at the end of the, 19, of the 1870s. And um, he becomes really, in effect, the biggest citizen in Thames. Dunedin um, Brewing got caught up in the gold rush in the 1860s. There were a lot of small breweries all over central Otago and Dunedin. But the first big brewery in Dunedin was in the 1870s when Spates was set up, a very powerful brewery. And over the next few years, certainly the most powerful brewery in New Zealand. The greatest brewery in New Zealand for a really long time, from the late 19th century through to about the Second World War, was Spates in Dunedin. So Spates was founded in 1876, and it was founded by three guys. James Spate, Charles Greenslade, and William Dawson. Greenslade was a baker who became a maltster. James Spate was a travelling salesman uh, and a seller of beer. And Dawson arrived in Port Chalmers with no money, but he knew how to brew. So those three guys got together. They bought a, an old brewery called the Well Park Brewery and established their premises in Rattray Street. So there was a bore on the site uh, down around about 72 metres and that water is of good quality. It's, uh, it's taken some time to percolate through the, the rocks and strata to the aquifer and it's good uh, quality water for brewing and it's still used by Spates to this day. They set out to go into partnership but James Spate was the minority shareholder. He only owned 20% of Spates initially um, but they used his name which is quite unusual. Uh, but he was the guy selling it door to door as well, so to speak. Spates got off the ground really in terms of making a name for itself in 1880 when it won uh, a gold medal at the Melbourne show. They tried to make a big song and dance about it, but the Otago Daily Times refused to run a story on this. And, and the Otago Daily Times actually said that Spates beer wasn't as good as the imported British beer they currently had. So Spates took out an advertisement in the rival Evening Star proclaiming the fantastic quality of their beer and it was really what propelled them into the public consciousness in Dunedin and set them off on the journey that would make them the longest lasting brewery in New Zealand that's been in one place. They were the first, as far as I know, to export beer to Australia. They sold beer in uh, the North Island. Um, Real Dunedinus who lived in uh, the North Island always <laughs> used to say that it didn't travel very well. Uh, it was always better drunk in Dunedin. But it was also the brewery that was fundamental to the um, beginning of New Zealand breweries in the 1920s. One of the things that made Spates so fantastic, apart from the quality of the beer, was their amazing distribution network. Uh, they even owned their own boat at one point, or their own ship. Uh, which they used to cart beer up to the North Island and get it there as fast as possible and in the freshest possible state. Pre-war Spates uh, had quite a reputation. Uh, it was based on the Burton Ales out of England because William Dawson, the brewer, uh, was trained in Burton on Trent. And that beer was highly awarded and became quite popular in Australia as well. With the British influence, they were making ales and they made those for a number of years. It's conjecture, but I'd imagine it was a reasonably high alcohol and reasonably well hopped. So just as IPAs going from the UK to India held up really well, having beers of that sort of style would ensure that they lasted well with it as they travelled around the country. <laughs> 